Salutations YouTube. Here I am with five things I have been up to lately. Three of which are books. So usually in the summertime when I do have time off, uh, which I had a, a week in June, a week in July, um, I do tend to read books a little faster than my normal pace uh, just because I can go outside and sit in my chair and, and read for as long as I want really when I'm off it's great not like during the work week when you finally go to bed and you're like oh, I'm gonna read a bunch before I go to bed and you read one page and you're done right so <laughs> so that's what weeks off are really good for is helping me catch up on my books so without uh, further ado let's get into those books shall we the first one is the ninth and final entry in the Expanse series called Leviathan Falls. As this final story is picking up, we kind of have three different main parties that are that are doing whatever they're doing. Um, the Laconians, who are um, trying to wrestle control of the galaxy um, from everybody, are are kind of they're doing two things. They're looking for the Rachinante, if that's how you say the name of that ship. Basically, Jim Holden and Naomi and all those... Or, is that her name, Naomi? Yeah. Um, and, and Alex and Amos and all those guys. They're, they're trying to hunt them down while at the same time looking for their leader, Winston Duarte, who has had a bit of a run-in with the proto-molecule and uh, he has disappeared and he is undergoing some changes. Let's just say that much. Um, on the other side of it, the crew of the Rachinante, uh, Jim and Amos and Alex and Naomi, like I mentioned, they are trying to stay on the run from the Laconians while also trying to coordinate and check in with all the different members of the resistance that's that's being uh, uh, kind of coordinated by Naomi and, and going up against the Laconian Empire. Um, in the middle, we have a scientific research vessel that is, is parked in a system where they're studying an artifact as well as some a couple of people that have been infected by the proto molecule they're trying to figure out what 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 exactly this alien race is all about who who left the ring gates and the proto molecule and uh and, and the other alien race that um kind of destroyed them or, or attempted to destroy them so they're doing all these tests and these experiments to try and figure out exactly how the proto molecule and all that stuff works um so that they can um combat it and hopefully save the galaxy uh, because there's been all sorts of strange things going on almost like this alien race is testing all of the ring gates and all the different uh, systems in terms of trying to wipe all the people out so every once in a while there will be like in a system gravity will fail for like a couple seconds or whatever and, and then the incident will go, go back under control and then some people will totally black out and then come to afterwards other people are getting killed um so it's these aliens kind of testing you know how do we deal with these humans that we kind of know are there but they're not really that big of a deal sort of thing so th this vessel lv okoye is the main doctor in in charge of this and she's trying to figure out how to combat these aliens and the things they're trying to do to uh, all of humanity so also on the Laconian side of things, a crazy bitch named Tanaka is trying to hunt down Winston Duarte. And at the same time, she's coming into contact with Jim Holden and his crew. And uh, those those encounters don't go very well. Um, so we have these three different parties that eventually uh, a ceasefire is kind of offered by the Laconians. But it's a trick. Uh, so Holden and his crew barely escape. And the, the, the rebellion takes a huge amount of losses. Um, uh, um, and then eventually the, the, the crew of the Rachinante, they go on the run. And uh, the place they end up running to is to LV Okoye's space station where all this scientific research is going on. Because although LV has been record, reporting back to her Laconian overlords, she's also been sharing the information with Jim Holden and his crew because she's like, this isn't just a Laconian versus Rebellion sort of problem. This alien race that's trying to wipe us all out, it's a humanity problem. So she's sharing this information with as many people as she can um, in these leadership roles that can try and hopefully help figure out how do we get out of this situation, right? So in the end, they, another ceasefire is, is, is called for as they um, think they have found 
Duarte and they think they're going to go in uh, and get him and try and find a way to get him to end a, a lot of things that are going on because he's been like I said he's been changed by the proto molecule and I don't want to give too much away but uh, there's quite a quite a finale to this book and uh, and it's kind of sad that it's over to be honest but if I'm feeling up to it I can now watch the TV show and see how they took the vision of the books and put it onto the screen. Um, usually it's not as good. The books are always better than movies, TV shows, whatever. But uh, I hope it's it's good enough to be, you know, a good series, right? Next up, Alien, Colony War. This book features um, Ripley's daughter, Amanda, um, in, in a sense. So basically there's this girl named Cher She's a journalist, and she is trying to figure out why her sister Shy uh, was killed in some sort of incident at at uh, some sort of I can't remember what kind of facility it was, but she, she was killed, and it's suspect. And Cher wants to get to the bottom of it and report on this and figure it out, um, but she's not having much luck. Suddenly, she's contacted by a guy named Chad McLaren, I think his name is, who is actually the husband of Amanda Ripley, Ellen Ripley's daughter. Um, and he leaves some cryptic notes and information for Cher, um, and eventually meets up with her. And he tries to explain to her what happened to his wife and why, what happened to Cher's sister, because he knows what happened. It's the xenomorphs. Now he tells her about these things and she's like, bullshit, some black insect monsters that are capable of gestating inside a human being and growing full going full grown in like three hours and you know basically basically are a scourge uh wherever they touch she doesn't believe it but it does explain why her sister died so questionably so she eventually concedes to chad's uh, ideas of this alien race but she's like um, if you want me to report on this and get this out into the mainstream so that um, it can be dealt with, you're going to have to show me proof of these monsters. So he's like, I know just the place to go. Now, at this time, they're on a world called New Albion, which is a newer uh, settlement on a planet. Um, and, and there's some strife going on uh, on the planet. And it has a lot to do with the, uh, with the xenomorphs. So just before... Chad and Cher, sorry, and Chad's AI named Davis are set to leave New Albion and go to a colony. Uh, the planet's in lockdown, uh, but they manage to escape. They manage to get to this colony, which is LV-187. Some sort of mining facility, I think, was on it. Um, but the xenomorphs got there. They basically wiped out the majority of the population. Uh, there's a girl there named um, Marion, Mir Miriam, something like that, and her daughter that have survived. And that's who Chad and um, Cher run into when they get down there um, as their ship fails. But also arriving are some uh, colonial marines, I believe it is, that are taking the facility for their own because New Albion has had some sort of a leadership change or whatever. Um, but the whole thing... The Xenomorphs being on this facility was actually orchestrated by the New, New Albion government to have some sort of leverage um, uh, with, with the, the, Z, the valuable Xenomorphs. Um, so basically it, it, it turns into a classic alien type tale, right? Where the, all these people end up in this facility and they're like, oh shit, now we have to escape because these bloodthirsty monsters are on the loose, right? So um, they have to find a way to get off the planet with... Uh, hordes of xenomorphs uh, zeroing in on their location as well as some interference from outsiders that uh, isn't necessarily the most helpful kind of interference um, so yeah it's just a matter of can they survive can they get off world and once they are is Cher going to be able to report on this uh, alien race and bring the xenomorph secret out of the shadows and into the world so hopefully there can be a bit of uh responsibility applied towards the management of the xenos like in instead of trying to capture them and weaponize them and all the sorts of shit well, just eradicate them please right like hey, it's just one man's opinion but that's what i'd be doing right um 
really good book. All the Aliens books I've read have been really good. I actually should have read a book called Into Charybdis before this one. This one's a follow-up to that one, so I read them out of order, but I didn't know they were all linked. So I've actually ordered, I think, Into Charybdis uh, to show up next week, I think. So I'll kind of know after that what led into this book, which will be nice. Last book, Star Wars, The High Republic, Convergence. Now this, I think, so far is the first book in the High Republic public series in terms of timeline so this takes place many many years before the high republic stories i've read to date um and so the main focus is two worlds Irum and arano which are are right next to each other and they share a moon um but they're currently locked in the middle of a, a nasty war uh Irum is a ocean filled world but also suffers really huge storms that's capable of causing huge damage on the planet whereas Irino is a desert planet and they are currently going through the worst drought they've had in a long long time so everybody has nothing to drink and whatever so this the straits on both planets are, are a little brutal um and it doesn't help that they just can't get along and they're, they're constantly trying to wipe each other out so this situation is unfolding between these two planets and there is a party of two girls led by this mysterious um, woman called Mother who are trying to fuel the fires of this war and keep it going for some reason. Enter the Jedi. They show up in the system um, because they've been asked, I think by, I think by Irem has requested Republic and Jedi assistance uh, to help solve this situation. So a cruiser with uh, four Jedi on it show up and they uh, attempt to you know, organize a peace summit, get them all talking together and stuff like that. But it doesn't go all that well. And when they first arrive in the system, they're right in the middle of a bit of a firefight. Um, Arano, uh, they have some ships in orbit waiting for an ice a hauler to arrive to get them water. Um, and they cross a boundary because one of their fighters goes out of control. This is sabotage from those two girls I mentioned. And it kicks off some sort of a dust up. Um, so in, in the in the process of this fighting, the princess of Irino, a girl named Ziri, ends up her starship ends up crashing in the ocean on Irum. Now it just so happens that a guy named Fan Tu Zen, who is the kind of prince of Irum, ends up rushing into the waves uh, to pull this girl from her ship before she drowns. And uh, although she's first very apprehensive about him and pulls a knife on him when she pull when he pulls her out of the water. Uh, they soon uh, are able to talk her down and she agrees to be taken back to the palace and returned um, to her family uh, on Irino once it can be arranged. Um, so Ziri and Fantu start getting to know each other a little bit as the peace summit goes on and they're greatly involved of it in, in, in it, of course, because they're the heirs to both planets. And a young Jedi Knight named Jelen Natai is the one kind of organizing or helping with this peace summit and is the one really getting to know Fantu and Ziri and um, almost becoming friends with them in a way. Um, and there's a fourth young person on the way. At this point in Star Wars lore, I guess, there are two chancellors of the Republic. One of them arrives along with the, um, or side by side with the Jedi party that arrived and the other one's back on Coruscant still, or wherever they operate out of. Um, so Malo, the guy that's in system, is a uh, Mon Calamari, whereas Chancellor Greylark is a human, and she's back on Coruscant, and she ends up sending her son Axel, who's like a bit of a troublemaker, getting in trouble with gambling, drinking, fighting, um, but she just wants to keep him out of trouble. She wants him to go to these planets and just report back to her basically on what's happening. So he kind of becomes the fourth young person in this little um, group of people um, with Fantu, Ziri, Jela Natai, and now Axel Greylark. Um, so with the dealings with these young people, um, they help come up with an idea that oh maybe Ziri and Fantu should get married an arranged marriage that will bring the two royal families together the two planets together 
um, the way it used to eons in the past. Um, and both of them are very amenable to the idea and they decide to go for it. But of course it's met with great resistance. Um, uh, people on both planets feel like, oh, you just caved, you abandoned us, you're shacking up with the enemy, blah, blah, blah. Some people are really happy about it. They, they see it as a, a way to end the war and uh, get to more favorable conditions on their planet. So there's very mixed reactions. And as the young couple goes on a relief tour of the planets, uh, bringing aid and, and, um, and relief supplies, uh, they run into very different types of situations. Uh, sometimes they're fighting for their lives as they're being challenged by people that are upset about the arrangement. Other times they're being celebrated. Um, but there's a lot more going on behind the scenes with some of the characters that are manipulating events to try and get their own ends met. And in the end, it there's a good bit of action going on as the truth is revealed and uh, great disaster is is... Well, it's not avoided. It actually unfolds on one of the planets, but uh, they do bring the person to justice or the people to justice who have, you know, provided all the headaches along the way. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's a very interesting end to the story. Now, I won't give too much away as well, but in this book, um, I forget in the High Republic, there's those that pirate group of pirate you know they have the the storm and the storm clouds and all that i forget what they're called but they're not around in this book but you can see where that group uh came from it's it's almost like the genesis the first steps to creating that organization starts in this book many years before we get into that era so uh it's kind of a cool little easter egg where you kind of see the beginnings of that whole that whole group uh forming in this in this book so that was cool next up finally watched The Eternals. It was not a bad movie. It wasn't great, but it wasn't terrible. Most people I heard thought it was it was brutal, but I think it's a lot of it's because it just it's a Marvel movie. You're expecting a Marvel superhero movie that ties into all the other stuff they've done. And this movie's just so far removed from those um, that it's just kind of a standalone thing that people were probably like, eh, it didn't have Thor, it didn't have Hulk, it didn't have Iron Man, eh, you know. Um, but basically, 5000 BC, there's um, a group of 10 heroes called Eternals. Basically, they're almost, well, they are eternal, unless uh, somebody finds a way to kill them, right? They'll live forever. And a, a, some sort of strange, otherworldly being named Ereshem kind of gives them, created them and gives them their commands. And in 5000 BC, they are sent to Earth to deal with um, a group of evil beings that have been released on Earth no, known as Deviants, the big monsters that are just terrorizing um, all of the uh, Earth's population. So they're sent there to repel this threat. And although it takes many, many hundreds, thousands of years even to finally get this under control, they manage it. And then they all just kind of go, in, not into hiding on Earth, but they just assume earthly roles um, as they wait for Ereshem to issue his next set of orders. Um, skip forward to current times, and the Eternals have all, they're all separated around the globe, they're all living their own lives, um, but two of them, Siri and Sprite, are out one night in England, I believe, and where a Deviant suddenly pops up out of the canal and attacks them, and they're like, what the fuck? Deviants are back? So they try and round up all the other Eternals from whatever they're doing, wherever they are, uh, to find out that their leader, Ajax, has been killed in the meantime. So uh, everybody takes this as a shock, and, but eventually they put it behind them and they start trying to solve this problem of the deviants. Now, as the movie goes on and the action continues and more secrets are un un unraveled, um, it turns out that the... Erisham's motives for the deviants and everything um, are very twisted and the Eternals suddenly have a, a huge um, kind of shock to digest um, as they are real well I don't want to give too much away but basically they've been manipulated all this time and Erishem's plan for Earth was never for them to protect it but to use it 
as a means to an end. And that's all I'm going to say because it was kind of cool what uh, what he was using it for and, and w what was going to happen should the Eternals not be able to, uh, you know, to, to shut that threat down. So that's all I'm going to say. But yeah, I think it's it's... I found the story a good one. I found the action pretty good. I think it was a long movie with a lot of slow parts. I think people may have had a problem with that. Um, I think that's probably would be my biggest complaint about it. They could have cut a lot of it out and had it not really mattered, right? Um, and the other thing is, yeah, I just it's not tied to all the other big glossy Marvel movies that people go crazy about these days. So I think it was just a little underwhelming for people when none of their favorite characters were were in it at all right so that's just my thoughts but uh, I could be right it could be wrong but either way it doesn't matter because I'm insignificant especially next to the power of the force last item Lego Star Wars the Skywalker saga for the PS4 I love Lego games I remember the first one that I got was the OG Star Wars one for, I think, I played that one on GameCube maybe? Yeah, I think. And uh, ever since that, you know, all the series, I love the Indiana Jones, the Harry Potter, um, all the, the DC stuff, the Marvel stuff. Um, there's tons more that I'm forgetting, but uh, yeah, I've enjoyed them all. The uh, Incredibles, like there's just tons of stuff. Um, but of course I love the Star Wars ones the best because Star Wars is my favorite franchise. So when this was announced and delayed and delayed for so long, it was all during COVID, I think, um, I was finally so pumped to finally get it. And uh, it's a pretty good Star Wars game. It's not my favorite Lego Star Wars game, but it's, it's pretty solid. It basically covers all nine movies of the Skywalker Saga film bonanza and I think each each movie installment in each trilogy contains about five levels, five game levels. And uh, if you've never played a Star Wars or a Lego game before, basically you play through the um, the events of each movie, and but everything's Lego. Um, and uh, what you want to do when you go through a level is breaking things, building things, all get you stuff um and uh and there's a lot of stuff to be had there's a lot of unlockables in these games there's a lot of characters ships uh little cheats and hacks and effects you can use in the game that you can unlock so you make your way through each level complete them move on to the next movie until you've you've basically run through the whole the whole um film bonanza right now when you go through a level for the first time you won't complete it fully Basically, the characters in the game all have different sets of abilities, like Jedi and Sith um, can use the Force to lift things and move things. Uh, bounty hunters have blasters that are capable of, of destroying the, the golden objects you'll find throughout the game, whereas some like Imperial characters um, have thermal detonators that are capable only the only thing capable of blowing up these silver crates. Um, scoundrels have... Um, kind of this bullseye shooting thing that apply in certain situations that, that only they can do. Certain droids can hack certain things, right? So in order to fully complete a level, you need a whole plethora, 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 plethora of characters available for you to use that you can switch between in order to do all these different things. So when you go through a, a level for the first time, you're, you're, you're only allowed to use the characters assigned to that level um, that, that play through that story level. Once you've beaten the level, you'll unlock the level on free play. You can go back and redo it, and you'll have any character that you've unlocked and purchased available to use in that level. So then you can start cycling through characters in order to complete all these different tasks and objectives and fully complete uh, the level. So basically you do that for all, I guess it would be nine movies, five levels, was it 45 levels or something like that through the game, um, and, and then you'll beat it. So. Most of the levels are character-based levels where you're walking around and doing things. There are a small handful of levels in the game that are vehicle-based. Um, those are really fun as well. Um, yeah, so you just make your way through the game and you'll unlock tons of stuff uh, by collecting certain things. And you can then 
purchase those things once they've been unlocked in, in one of the game menus. And uh, if you want to get 100% on this game, it's it's a challenge. Uh, we got close. We got to 99, I think, or 98. There was just about four things, four blue bricks that we couldn't collect in the game that prevented us from getting the 100%. But uh, it's it's the Lego games are really good for replay um, because all in all, it probably doesn't take that long to play through the game the first time when you're just going through on story mode. But it makes you want to go back and redo it and unlock everything, right? And when you're talking about 45 levels and hundreds of characters to unlock and tons of ships, it takes a long time. It, keep you, it keeps you going on this game for quite a while. So I find the LEGO games are really good at providing a good value for what you pay for them. Plus, they're a ton of fun. Everybody loves LEGO. Uh, so seeing all your different favorite franchises represented in a LEGO fashion, because there's lots of humor used in the games as well, is just a really fresh take on, on stuff that you love and, uh, and that you're able to actually get in and interact with uh, while playing the game, right? So um, I love LEGO. I love LEGO video games. I love Star Wars. So naturally, it was a fit. Um, I don't know what LEGO games have on the horizon for us next, but I hope they either keep some of my favorite franchises going with more installments. I love a new Indiana Jones game with um, with the new movie that came out this summer. Um, I'd really like it if they got into Transformers, but I doubt that's going to happen. But I, that would be a really cool series. Um, but either way, I hope they keep them coming and maybe even introduce some new series that could be fresh and exciting. But uh, yeah, I'm sure there will be more. It's just a matter of when and what and when can I buy it. Meow.